So today's sermon is Demon Democracy or God's Kingdom. Demon Democracy or God's Kingdom. Your choice. And let me go ahead and give you a heads up. I may be about to give American folks and American folks who live in the Southeast, which is all most of us, a little bit of a headache on a couple counts here. So just, just stay, stay with me. Now, let me ask you this. Um, and I am pretty consistently pounded with this by our friends and my friends and colleagues and brothers and sisters uh, with the UK partnership and our mission partners over in the United Kingdom in Great Britain, especially a few years ago when they still had wonderful Queen Elizabeth as their queen. They would ask me this question. They would say, you know, in the Bible, does the Bible promote democracy? And I'd say, no, the Bible doesn't promote democracy. And they would say, what is the form of government upheld by the Bible? And I would have to give them this because I know the Bible. I don't know if you know the Bible. Monarchy, right? But let's look at this. So the Bible holds up which type of government? Not democracy. Or even a form of democratic republic like what we have here in the United States. But by the way, certainly not tyranny or dictatorship, but instead a very special what? Very special what? What do you fill in the blank if you're following along with the sermon notes? The Bible holds up what? A very special monarchy, right? A divine monarchy. Now, let me go back to, and parents, you really need to know this so you know how to pray and so you can teach your children how to pray. When Jesus teaches us to pray not for the coming of our democracy. Did y'all know that? Jesus teaches us to pray not for the coming of our democracy, but for the coming of what? Can you fill in the blank? Parents, I hope you can, because you need to teach your children how to pray. Christians, you need to know how to pray. Jesus teaches us to pray for the coming of what? God's kingdom. God's kingdom. That's what we pray for. Jesus teaches us to pray for the coming of God's kingdom. <sighs> to each of us, it comes down to one or the other. You are going to end up with one or the other. I can have my vote in a demon democracy, or I can be saved by the king and be his subject. Which one are you going to choose? Demon democracy or God's kingdom? Let's turn to God's word now from Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 39, picking up where we left off last Sunday, our scripture last Sunday, was 8, chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. Jesus' calming of the storm, his rebuking of the waves and the wind. Now we move on. Remember, Jesus is in motion. He's going across the Sea of Galilee. This is this mission project that Jesus is on. Then, after that, they sailed down into the region of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had come out on land, there met him a man out of the city who had demons. For a long time he had not worn clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell face down, prostrate before him, and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. Because he was commanding the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Now, for many times it had seized him, and though he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they were begging him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now, there was a herd of many pigs where it was feeding on the hill, the hillside, and they begged him to permit them enter these, and he permitted them. 
Then the demons went out of the man. They entered into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and reported it in the city and in the countryside. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, clothed and in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And they were afraid. And those who had seen what had happened told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the multitude of the surrounding region of the Gerasenes asked him, asked Jesus, to depart from them because they were seized with great fear. So getting into the boat, he returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, with Jesus. But Jesus sent him away saying, no, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So again, Jesus teaches us to pray not for the coming of our democracy, but for the coming of God's kingdom. Because in the Bible, majority vote almost always leads to groupthink what? What goes in the blank there in your sermon notes? Uh, majority vote almost always in the Bible leads to groupthink flowing into what? Rebellion against God. And in, majority vote almost always leads to disasters, moral decline of a society. Can you believe that when we get what we want? Y'all probably don't believe me on this, but just, I, just bear with me now. Actually, our culture is not on an uptick spiritually. I know I'm shocking some of us, but it's, it's really not. Uh, moral decline and oppression. Because we think we're going to be free, but actually then certain people and certain systems and cultures and technologies take us over and we become slaves to all these things, right? That's the way it works. The Bible tells us this. You know, written 2,000, 3,000 years ago tells us this. And all this follows from and fuels even more groupthink fears, not faith and godliness. Now, in our passage for today, Luke 8, 26 through 39, there are two sets of democratic votes. I want to highlight this for you. There are two sets of democratic votes, each unanimous and each deadly. I mean, man, we have great elections. There's no, you know, there's no dispute on the results on these elections. It's not that close, and we're not saying, well, some ballots were stuffed or this or that. It's, it's outright democratic vote. First of all, all the demons in the legion ask or vote to enter into a herd of pigs. It's the first big vote. And then secondly, all the region's multitude of people. These are people now, not demons. They fearfully ask Jesus to get out, to leave them alone. That's the way most people are going to vote, by the way, even to this day. So we have an either or. Are you going to go with the crowd and vote just like everybody else votes? Are you going to be subject to the real king? See, I can have my vote in a demon democracy, or I can be saved by the king and be his subject. It's just one or the other. In the larger segment of scripture we're looking at last Sunday, today, and next Sunday, Luke 8, 22 through 56, as I highlighted for you last Sunday in the sermon last Sunday, we're dealing with a new series of miracles. I mean, Jesus has done these kind of miracles before, but now he's at a stage where he's developing his disciples into the people who are going to carry his mission into the world because he's not always going to be with them. So he's developing a church, the apostles, other disciples, including the women who are supporting his ministry, who've been saved by him. And he wants them to have a missionary faith. And let me say this again, a missionary faith. If you actually believe in Jesus, you will be in mission and you will support mission. Just guaranteed. A missionary faith 
in Jesus as Lord with authority. Let me emphasize this term. Jesus not only has the power, he has the authority, okay? You could give me a uh, million dollars and I'm like a bank teller, but I don't have authority to appropriate it for myself. Jesus has not only the power to do something, he has the authority over that power. So he not only has the power, he authorizes himself, okay? So he wants us to understand that, that he has authority over danger, natural dangers, that's last Sunday, over the demonic realm and the armies of the devil, that's today, and then next Sunday over disease and death. Danger, the demonic, the devilish stuff, disease and death. So remember what we saw last Sunday. Jesus comes up with this kind of offhand crazy proposal. Let us go across over to the other side. And he means over to the other side of Lake Gennesaret or the Sea of Galilee. Well, what does that mean? It means that Jesus is taking his disciples, first of all, into a storm. They don't know of it, he does. He's taking them into a literal windstorm. We looked at that last Sunday. Go back to last Sunday's sermon and listen to it, how he deals with that. And then secondly, now today, into the Decapolis. Now, let me remind you that the Decapolis is a kind of loose association of 10 Greco-Roman cities that spread out uh, east, primarily east. Uh, Psychopolis is, you know, just south of Galilee, but basically the rest are all east of uh, Galilee, okay, and of, of the Jordan. And they include these cities where, here's the thing, it's not predominantly, it's neither predominantly Jewish nor Armenian, okay, nor other, you know, groups. It's Greco-Roman, which means these look like Roman cities with the amphitheaters, with the slave trade, with uh, all the temples to the gods and goddesses and all the Roman kind of Greco-Roman culture. That's what these cities are like. So Jesus is taking his Jewish disciples over into Greco-Roman world, like right where the temples are. And the, okay. So this is kind of wild that Jesus is doing that. Now let's go, let me show you where this is and we can go to the next slide. I think I'll have this up. Yeah, okay, so now Jesus was in Capernaum up on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And he's gonna take his folks across the sea into what happened to be a storm, okay? but he rebukes and has authority over the storm. And so the storm ends up being calm at Jesus' feet. I want you to get the visual here. The storm is calm at Jesus' feet. Guys who are with me in Revelation, remember Revelation chapter four, the sea is under God's feet. The chaos has been calmed by God. Revelation chapter four, and remember how we saw the prophecies of that in the Old Testament, okay? Revelation folks, y'all remember this. This runs through the Bible, this is a big thing. Well, that's happened. But now Jesus is gonna take his folks over. He's probably landing near Kersi or Gergesa, and he's going into the region of the Gerizines. That's the dominant uh, textual reference. There's some others, uh, Gergesa and Gadara too. But anyway, it sweeps down southeast from where you see, where you see where that arrival beach is in Kersi and the tombs. He's heading down from there. That's where he's landing, and he's heading down southeast. Um, Jesus takes his disciples, in other words, on foreign mission into the Decapolis, the 10 city area, okay? But he's also taking them for folks, I'm gonna rub some others of us the wrong way, into the SEC. Now I know we've got people who think, you know, God is like the chairman of the SEC, but he's taking them into the Southeastern Conference because look, let's go to the next visual, I can show you this. So most of these cities, these cities where Jesus is taking them, see Gerasa is like 34 miles inland. Jerash, Jordan, if you've ever been to Jordan, you may have gone to Jerash, incredible Roman, um, you know, uh, uh, city there. Jerash, but also see how he's moving southeast here. He's going into the Southeastern Conference, otherwise known as the Decapolis. This is where pagans and wild people live. Like even to this day, the Southeastern Conference, right? So, all right, now, now that's, that's the, the map of the Decapolis cities over there, the ones in black. And, and Decapolis number picks up actually the ancient city of, um, 
Damascus. By the way, down there where it says Philadelphia, do you see that? That's modern Amman, Jordan. That's Amman, Jordan right there where it says Philadelphia. So that's where he's going. Now, let me take you to Kersey. I'll take you to Kersey over on the shore if we can go. Yeah, so there it is. You see the route again. And that's my crew uh, from 2019 when we were at Kersey and kind of moving up around where the caves were, where this guy you know, hangs out in the hills. So you see you're looking back. You see that in the background behind my crew there, the Sea of Galilee. And that's where, that's where we're looking at. Let me ask you this. Are we going to get calm after the storm? And the answer, if you're with Jesus, is no. The sea is calm, but if you're going to grow as a disciple, it's not going to be calm most of the time. You will actually be challenged to grow. And that's exactly what happens here. So Jesus calms the storm, but then he moves on to a new challenge. A new challenge. And he gets to the shore, and this is really interesting. He has a greeting party. Now, I don't know if you all know about when big dignitaries visit. If you follow the news last week, there was a big hoopla over President Xi of the People's Republic of China visiting San Francisco. And so for weeks prior to this, uh, the state of California and San Francisco, they moved homeless people out of the area where APAC was going to be. They spent millions of dollars cleaning up the streets of San Francisco. Do you all know this? So that we could impress President Xi and the other foreign dignitaries when they arrived. This was the, and then there was all kinds of greeting party. President Biden greeted President Xi, our good friend, you know, and it was just, it was just like, that's, that's what you do with dignitaries. Uh, so let's look at the greeting party for Jesus. The homeless people are not moved, and the demoniac is the guy, not only is he not moved, he's the guy who greets Jesus. Isn't that a wonderful greeting party? A crazy, violent demoniac is the guy who greets you at the shore. So if the disciples were wondering, are we going to get like a little peaceful breakfast after the big storm last night? No, 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 it's not going to be a peaceful breakfast. So here he is, the crazed demoniac with violent superpower strength. If you like the Marvel movies, this is your guy. This is kind of like the Incredible Hulk on steroids. This guy is, he is incredible. He was kept under guard when you love to be one of his guards, you know, out there in the caves with all the, you know, bones and everything and the demons. He was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. But it turns out this is exactly, if we've been following the gospel, the kind of people Jesus comes to save. This, this guy is the kind of person Jesus comes to save. Remember what Jesus said in his inaugural sermon in his home synagogue at Nazareth? Quoting from Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim what? Liberty to the captives and to send out the oppressed in freedom, in a phasis. It's a big term that Luke is pulling from Isaiah, out in freedom. And then remember this now, the key verse really as I see it to the gospel and the gospel mission in Luke's entire gospel book is what we're going to get to much later as Jesus closes out his time with Zacchaeus. Luke 19, verse 10, the Son of Man came. Why did the Son of Man come? Why did Jesus come down here on earth? To seek and to save the best people in town? To seek and to save the lost. Now, if you want a poster child for somebody who is oppressed and lost, just show me the garrison <laughs> demoniac, right? Uh, now, let's go back to a couple of questions. One question is this. It's what the disciples asked after Jesus rebuked and showed that he had authority over the wind and the waves. They said, who is this then that he even has authority over the wind and the waves? This is like crazy. This must be God, you know? Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's their fearful, awe-filled question after witnessing Jesus' authority over all nature. Well, now we get an answer to that question, and it comes from the demoniac. Who is Jesus? The demoniac fearfully identifies Jesus, tries to manipulate him, and says, what have you to do with me, Jesus? Here he is, son of the most high God. Well, that echoes what Gabriel 
says to Mary at the Annunciation. We'll think about this during Advent and Christmas. Remember what Gabriel says to Mary? You know, you're going to conceive and bear a son. And he will be called what? He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. So that demon guy is calling Jesus the same thing. What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? This reminds us back in cycle one of Jesus' public ministry, early in his public ministry, back to Luke chapter four, when Jesus delivers a demoniac there. Remember what the demoniac says to Jesus, Luke four, verse 34. Ha, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. A couple of things on this. Remember that Jesus rebukes the, the demoniac and tells him to stop testifying because this is hellish testimony to Jesus. This is not saving testimony to Jesus. Jesus wants you and me. He wants his disciples to profess who he is. This is not saving profession. This is manipulation of Jesus. In fact, there are some people today even who would call themselves Christians who use the name of Jesus as the Christ, but they want to get their way instead of being subject to him as the king, and that's manipulation. Jesus has nothing to do with that. Jesus, has, You can't just use an abracadabra, you know, evoking of the, an invoking of the name of Jesus and think you're going to get your way. This is what the demons try to do with Jesus. Another thing on this too, you'll notice both in that passage and in this passage especially, we go back and forth, it's a little confusing from singular to plural on these demoniacs. It's because, obviously, in the case of Legion, there are multiple demons, I mean multiple demons, but they're all kind of fusing together to control one guy and present him as one guy. Okay, so we go back and forth. And we got to remember, keep our eye on the guy. So now Jesus asked, you know, this is the answer of who Jesus is. What is your name? Now I want you to catch this. The man does not respond, Philip or Stephanus or Andrew, right? He responds, Legion, which is a classic, intimidating demonic name. That's why, isn't there a legion field in Alabama? I mean, this, that, that's, uh, obviously you've got Southeastern Conference demoniac stuff going on anyway. So legion field, right? So anyway, this guy says, my name is legion. A Roman legion, let me remind you, was comprised of 6,000, let me repeat that, 6,000 foot soldiers, and an additional 120 horsemen and technical personnel. So I don't know if this is metaphorical, kind of generalized or specific, but we got a lot of demons going on in this guy. A lot of demons going on in this guy. And again, my question to you is, are you one of the demon democracy crowd? Or do you love and belong to Jesus the King? Because here's the thing, I really want you to understand this, I need to understand this. Even as badly off as this demon is, Jesus sees beyond the demons and beyond all the evil and the grossness into someone made in God's image. When Jesus looks at you, and when Jesus looks at your messed up friend, and when Jesus looks at somebody who's an addict, and when Jesus looks at somebody who is totally confused about their sexuality or their gender, when Jesus looks at people who have blown their lives and ruined their marriages and everything else, Jesus doesn't just see that. Underneath and believe, beneath it all, Jesus sees someone made in his image. I mean, isn't that incredible? He can see through to who you were meant to be to who that person who seems so messed up was meant to be. And that's what's going on here. So see, Jesus doesn't buy into calling this guy legion because Jesus knows who he really is. And you can, you know what, this, you can lose your identity to sin and shame and messed up decisions and addictions, but you can be saved by God in Jesus Christ no matter what your situation is. Do you believe that? It's true. That's what this scripture is telling us. So anyway, uh, going to a little higher level theology here, Werner Forster in the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, volume two. You can just pull it out of your own shelf if you want to. Uh, just He says this, this is really powerful. 
In most of the stories of possession, what is at issue is not merely sickness, but a destruction and distortion of the divine likeness. The center of personality, in other words, the center of who you are and how you act and your character, is, he uses the term inspired, just to clarify this, possessed, I would say possessed, by alien powers that seek to ruin humanity. You see, the devil hates God, and you're made in the image of God, so what does the devil want to overcome? Your likeness to God. Yeah, I understand this is a, a major spiritual battle. This is like the key spiritual battle you're dealing with here. So back to the demon democracy 1.0. The mighty majority, the legion, turns out only to be a craven crowd of fearful beggars when they encounter whom? What do you fill in that blank with? When they encounter the king. Because when the king shows up, they are freaking out. Wait a minute, our boss, you know, the general, the devil, retreated to a more opportune time and you're showing up in our territory and wanting to take our guy? They are freaking out. Do you understand what's going on here? Jesus shows up where the demons don't want him to show up. They are fearful beggars in his presence. I beg you. Notice this. They are obeisant to Jesus. They are bowing down to Jesus, but this is not faith bowing down to Jesus. This is just acknowledging his power and his authority. I beg you. They begged him to order them into the, not to order them into abyss, but into the pigs. Now, this is really funny because... Again, Revelation, if you're with me in Revelation, you know this. The devil and the demons end up in the abyss. Okay, They're going to end up in the abyss. But they don't want to go there now. So they ask to go into these pigs. And what we have here is the deliverance of the demoniac through what happens. Salvation, just like I talked about the last several sermons, salvation comes through judgment. It's not a beam me up Scotty kind of salvation. Jesus takes us through the judgment and saves us through the judgment and deliverance in the face of sin and evil. That's exactly what's going on here. And this is also a really bad demon democracy vote. I'm telling you, usually the majority in the crowd make the wrong decision. Don't go with the crowd. Teenagers, don't go with the crowd. They make the wrong votes, okay? This is a really bad vote. Because you know what happens, right, is... By the way, don't worry about the pigs. They're going to be in hog heaven, whatever. You know, the, the, the pigs, look, the pigs are a device. They serve God's purposes to totally destroy these demons. And their next stop is the abyss because they go to the bottom of the sea. They're drowned. So, again, Karl Barth, he's right on this. Um, he says this, the demoniac realm becomes farcical when encountering Jesus. Not just impotent. They're funny. They're funny in how stupid they are. He says this, it can only ask permission to go itself unclean into the herd of unclean swine to be drowned, thus perishing finally from the world. We should genuinely rejoice at this sign, Christians, and what it signifies. This is like the big story here. Exactly, you are seeing it in, in, in signs before you. So we've got the actual demons and demon democracy 1.0 making a really bad vote. But now what about the people? Demon democracy 2.0. Then the people went out to see what had happened. And they came in to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus. Remember how he was naked and all cut up? Now he's fully clothed. Remember how crazy he was? Now he's in his right mind. And so, therefore, all the people say, now we believe. We bow before you, King Jesus. We have total faith in you and rejoice in your authority. Is that what happens? Is that the way the people vote? Is that the way most people vote today? No. They are not filled with faith, but they're filled with fear. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. So it's the it's actually saved. Literally, associate means saved. The man had been saved. This picks up, listen to that for next week's sermon by Dean. This ongoing conversation here about faith and salvation, okay? So does this change their mind? Do they say, wait a minute, no, we're going to take another vote? Now we do believe in Jesus. You've explained to us exactly what happened, we believe. No. 
Then all the people of the surrounding region of the Gerasenes ask him to depart from them. That is their unanimous vote. Get out of here, Jesus. You're messing with our lives. You want to take over us. You're going to ruin our economy and our culture. We're prosperous to capitalist people. And you've just killed a bunch of pigs. Forget about that guy. We don't care about the guy. We care about our money and our pigs. See, people choose their, in their case, denarii. For us, it's dollars over divine deliverance and salvation of people. To this day, people who call themselves Christians and church members, and in their pledges and in their commitments and in their prayers, actually choose their own stuff and their own dollars over divine deliverance and salvation of people made in God's image. I, I don't get it. But that's what happens with demon democracy 2.0. Unanimous vote, please leave us. So he got into the boat, Jesus did, and he left him. He returned. No, Jesus. You don't want him? He'll leave you. Amid all the demonic democracies, bad votes, fearful begging, avoidance of Jesus, is there anyone to love and believe in Jesus? Well, yes, there is one. The guy who is the worst off of the whole group, the crazy demoniac who gets saved. There he is, again, like the calm sea, like the people we're going to see in next week's passage, at Jesus' feet, by the grace of God. Salvation through judgment, here is the one who is saved, the one who is healed. Now let me talk to you about some gospel ironies and gospel truth. First, those who oppose and reject Jesus will be granted their vote. You vote against Jesus, you'll, you'll get that vote. Democratic death. Number two, those saved and belonging to the king don't always get their begs, but are sent by him into missions sometimes they wouldn't have chosen for themselves. And number three, he sends us as his witnesses to share gospel grace even to rebels who think they want to live in the demon democracy and have rejected him once or twice or however many times. So let's go back to these. Number one, those who oppose and reject Jesus will be granted their beg. People who refuse to come to church, people who refuse to come and hear about Jesus, people who refuse Jesus, they'll, they'll ultimately get their way. As C.S. Lewis says in The Great Divorce, there are only two kinds of people in the end, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. In other words, you vote against Jesus, you'll eventually get that vote fully fulfilled. It's called hell total separation from Jesus and his saving grace. You'll get what you ask for. And all the region's people ask Jesus to get out. Get out of their lives. Get out of their region. Number two, those saved and belonging to the king don't always get their begs, but they are sent by him in a mission. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might go with Jesus. But Jesus sent him away for a mission to his own people. Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. Which brings us to number three. Even though number one is ultimately true, God is a God of overflowing grace. And so he sends us as his witnesses to share the gospel of grace even to rebels who think they want to live in the demon democracy and don't want anything to do with Jesus. You know that? You can sit there and say, but I've already shared the gospel with them. Well, Jesus says, go back again. But they've rejected, and they're, they're making choices against God's will. Jesus says, go tell them what I've done in your life. Go share the gospel. So ultimately, we're back to this. I can have my vote in a demon democracy, or I can be saved by the king and be his subject. Can Jesus save anyone? Absolutely. Can Jesus free you from, you could be saying, well, I don't think Jesus can get me out. I'm just caught in a web of sin or addiction or problems, and I try to be good, but I keep falling back into this. Look, listen, your poster child, gospel person, is the demoniac. Jesus could save him. He can save you. He can deliver you. Can you and I freely in faith be at Jesus' feet too? Yes, we can. So I invite you today. And perhaps if you're bringing your commitment, your profession of faith to Jesus through your pledges today, to know him, believe in him, and trust him as you come before him today. Be delivered from the demon democracy and give thanks in your faith. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.
All right. Uh we hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.